Good afternoon, everybody. It's fantastic that you've all been able to join us this afternoon. Welcome to you all. Um, my name is Liz, uh, and I'm here with Ems, Claire, and Charlie. Um, we're all members of the Enrich team based here in the university in Cambridge. Um, it's wonderful that you've all been able to come along uh, and we'd just like to mention that we're extremely grateful to Trinity College here in Cambridge for uh, funding this event for us so that it's free for you to access. Um, just to make everybody aware, we're already recording the event, so please do make sure that your microphones are muted and your cameras are off throughout, please. Um, that would be uh, really helpful. Um, during the afternoon, we're going to be working on some mathematics together and we're going to invite you to participate um, uh, and contribute your thoughts and ideas using the chat facility. So if you think you're going to enjoy participating, please do make sure that you can access the chat feature. Usually you'll find a link to it in, in um, the menu, which is probably at the bottom of your screen. Another thing just to double check, please, is um, Check that you're happy with the way that your name is displaying uh, and do change that with the rename function if you would like to. Um, you have agreed to abide by our code of conduct in participating this afternoon uh, and I'm sure we won't have any difficulties but please do be respectful so that we can all enjoy this afternoon together uh, and work on mathematics uh, as a whole group. So I'm going to pass over now to Claire and to Charlie, who are members of the secondary Enrich team. They are responsible uh, for creating the wonderful problems that we're going to explore this afternoon. So I'm going to sh stop sharing my screen and Claire is going to share hers in instead. So Claire and Charlie, over to you. Okay, um, thank you, Liz. Um, so, oh. So Zoom just um, changed so I could see lots and lots of uh, just names. Um, I'm going to now share my screen. If I can find the right one. So, so hopefully you should now be able to see the um, Enrich site. Um, I mainly work on post-16 problems. Um, there's obviously some overlap of what Charlie does in secondary, so quite often we work on problems together. And one of the problems we want to talk about today is something called Curve Fitter. Um, this is a problem that's featured both on the secondary um, uh, part of the web page and also on the post-16 part. Um, so the way that you find the um, features, if you go to the main web page, click on secondary teachers, and then there will be a button to take you to the latest feature. Um, the problem that we want to look at today is called Curve Fitter. Uh, but before we talk about the problem as it is, um, I just wanted to share what it looked like when I found it um, a couple of months ago when I was looking for problems for this feature. Um, so Charlie, do you want to say something about this problem from when I, I first showed it to you? Yes, and I think it was more than a couple of months ago. I think probably I yes. seem to remember it was the summer and um, <clears throat> and Claire showed me this problem. Um, so we've got um, function which passes through the origin, it also passes through points one, two, and two, one, and there's a sketch of it. <clears throat> and um, the third sort of paragraph down um, said, although this curve might look like a cubic equation, it actually cannot be a cubic equation. Prove that this is the case. Um, and we th both thought, well, this was a really interesting question. Um, have I missed something? Uh, uh, um, and, um, oh, sorry, they had turning points through one, two, and two, one. Uh, it didn't just go through one, two, and two, one. Um, we thought that was, this was a really interesting question, but perhaps um, it needed a bit of scaffolding. Um, at Enrich, we talk quite often about low threshold, high ceiling tasks. So low threshold meaning there are problems that are easy to step into. Uh, high ceiling means that the challenge le level increases uh, the, the longer you spend on the problem. So 
we decided we wanted to uh, offer this question to students, but offer it in such a way that they could build up to it rather than be thrown into it. And so what we're wanting to do this afternoon with you is to try and recreate some of the conversations that Claire and I had, some of the thinking that informed the, fi the, the, the current form of the problem, which now looks very, very different to uh, that, that original one. So I think this is what Claire is going to show you next. <clears throat> yeah. Um, so this is how the problem looks now. Um, and we've broken it down into parts. Um, the first part does away completely with the idea of turning points. And it just asks, can you find a cubic which passes through the points 0, 0, 1, 2, and 2, 1? Um, when Charlie and I were talking about this problem uh, this morning to remind us about what, what we had done, um, we realised that we had kept th this idea of cubic all the way through, rather than thinking about other curves. Um, so what we have put into the teacher's resources um, underneath possible support is we've said that students could be introduced to the problem first by asking them to think to find a quadratic which passes through the three points 0, 0, 1, 2 and 2, 1, um, which then uh, links in a bit more nicely with um, lower key stage four work. Um, were we going to ask people on the chat for ideas? Yeah, so if you've got any ideas about how you might approach this problem with finding the quadratic that passes through these points, um, can you just pop something down into the chat? And then we'll talk about it. Okay, we've got a couple of ideas coming in uh, saying simultaneous equations. Um, we've got a few equations which have been found. Uh, was going to write the same thing, but it was too slow. I, I have that problem a lot. I had that problem yesterday. So we've got a few ideas um, popping in. Probably the first thing to think about is writing down the general quadratic <coughs> equation. So I would naturally call that AX squared plus BX plus C. And I think that's what some other people have used. And then you can talk about what data you've got. You know that when X equals naught, Y equals naught. You know when X equals one, Y equals two. And when X equals two, Y equals one. Um, there's a few people who I think have um, uh, who have decided that they're going to choose the point naught, naught first. And you, you can discuss with your students which of these is a good one to start using first. So if you put in the point naught, naught, we can see that C equals zero. And that means I've now reduced it to something that's only got two unknowns. Um, Charlie, do you want to say anything at this point or, or shall I keep going? Yeah, I'm assuming um, <coughs> we can write two more equations. Mm -hmm. um, when x equals one, y equals two. So two would equal <clears throat> um, a plus b. Oops, and not and, plus c. And then the, it goes to two, one. So one will equal four a plus two b. And I suppose if I was going to, uh, one way I might do this is um, double everything on the first equation, gives me four equals two A plus two B. 
and then if I subtract one from the other, <coughs> um, I've got, I think I might get negative three equals two A. And so A equals negative a half, negative one and a half, sorry. <coughs> And I can substitute that into two equals a plus b. That's, why, why did you choose that equation to substitute into? I think it was a lot easier than the other one. <clears throat> and I think that gives me b equals three and a half. <clears throat> I think I get b equals... Um, Seven over four. No, not seven over four, seven over two. Yes. Okay. Once they've got this equation, um, they can start, you, you can um, test it to see if it works. Uh, so we've already had um, talk about using Desmos. So I am just going to find Desmos, hopefully. Um, Charlie, has Desmos appeared? I beg your pardon? Has Desmos appeared on your yes, screen? Yes. Yeah, brilliant. <coughs> um, so what I'd quite like to do is I'd quite like to put the points in so we can see whether or not it's hit. And then if we tick. And that's the label that you're ticking, aren't you? Yeah, so I've just ticked the label. It, it's not necessary, but it just makes it a bit clear that these are the points. And then the um, quadratic that me and Charlie found was minus, I tend to use 1.5 rather than 3 over 2 just because um, it yes. I don't end up with x's on the bottom of my fractions. And b was 3.5. Yeah. And c was 0. And c was 0. <clears throat> That's a nice way just to check that it's correct. Um, somebody suggested in the chat that we can uh, put in uh, sliders for A, a and B. Um, if you haven't used Desmos before, it's very easy. So if I'm doing things on the fly, I tend to use Desmos because it's just a little bit quicker. Um, if I'm trying to do things with a bit more functionality, I use JoJibra. Um, but as somebody said, you can stick some sliders in and then we know it's got to have a negative gradient and we can just play around with it until magically, since we already know the answer, <laughs> find the one that works. Yes. <clears throat> um, another possibility is if you wanted to even go further back, I don't want to say backwards, but further down the curriculum, you could ask the students, can they create a straight line that passes through all these three points? Um, once they've actually looked at the three points on a, on a graph, they can probably immediately say, no, I can't. Um, what they might do first is they might actually try and solve the equations, um, which is a, a, a point where saying, can you draw a sketch to show that this can't be done? And bring in the idea of, of not everything has to be algebra, you can use sketches as well to justify your um, uh, arguments. Um, so the important thing <clears throat> about what Claire has been showing you so far <clears throat> is this idea that there is a general quadratic and we can use that to generate some simultaneous equations and that we can also plot and use a graphical representation to check our work. And this is going to be an ongoing theme throughout the problem. So we thought it was worth spending a bit of time, and it might be well worth spending a bit of time with students working on quadratics, even if they're going to spend the rest of the problem working on cubic. So the idea is starting with something that they feel really comfortable and at ease with, um, <clears throat> and making sure that they can use the technology and, they, um, and that we can now build on to the, uh, the beginning, part, part one of, um, of the problem that we, that we published. So whilst Charlie's Charlie been talking up, she's been playing with the uh, Desmos sliders and the straight line and hitting either two points or no points. Um, I thought that point moved, but no, it was just the label that moved on me. 
Okay, so going back to the problem, um, the first part of the problem asks, uh, asks them to find a cubic which passes through these points. So what we'd like to do is just give you um, a couple of minutes and see if you can come up with a possible cubic that satisfies, um, th that will go through those three points. And again, put your ideas in the chat. I'm just going to start sharing a whiteboard again so that uh, I can start writing out the problem. There's a important thing with the um, language here. We've said a cubic, not the cubic. So in the chat, somebody said uh, two equations, three unknowns, which is true. Okay, we've had one possible answer, um, A equals one, B equals minus two, C equals minus a third. <clears throat> Same answer as previous question, a quadratic. Um, that's an interesting question. Is a quadratic a cubic or not? Okay, I think we'll do um, a little bit of talking through this question. Um, I've written down what a general cubic is. Um, students might not have met this, but they can extend the ideas of quadratics and put in an extra term. And if they've looked at the quadratic, they might realize that if they take the point naught naught, it means that immediately they can tell that D equals zero. Substituting in the other two points, we get these two equations, which I've seen written down in the chat. And two, one, one equals... 8a eight, eight plus 4b plus 2c. <clears throat> okay, at this point... Yeah. This mirrors what we did with quadratics. Yes. 
Yeah, so this is very similar to, to what we did with quadratics. They've now got three unknowns, which in key stage four, I, I don't think they will normally meet. But they can think about what they've done with quadratics and see if a similar technique will work. So if we double the first one, why have I doubled it to get four? That is not good. And my eraser is on the other screen, which also doesn't help. Okay. We'll try that again. We'll go for- 2 plus 2b plus 2c. Yeah. So I'm still on eraser. There we go. 2a plus 2b plus 2c. And then if you take that away from the equation that's above it, you get um, negative three equals 6a plus 2b. <clears throat> yeah. And hopefully at this point, um, the students will say, I I'm not sure what to do. And you can say to them, try a, a, try a value for one of the two numbers. Um, China, we were talking about this last time, and I think I've done things uh, in a slightly different order to what we agreed on. Um, the number Charlie wanted to use was uh, B equals three. Was that the number you wanted to use, Charlie? Um, that was one of the numbers. Um, I can't remember now, uh, yeah. perhaps. So I think B equals three is a, a number that Charlie suggested. Um, I suggested substituting in B equals zero because I, I like zeros, zeros make me happy. <laughs> um, if I substitute in B equals zero, I would then get um, A equals minus a half. And then I can substitute that into the last equation and get C equals probably five over two. Yes. Yes. Uh, substituting b equals three in gives us um, minus three equals six a plus six, so minus nine equals six a. a. I'm not sure b was your b three was your answer, Charlie. I think it was something else. Um, that gives me a equals minus three over two. I think. Yes, that's what I get. Yeah, <clears throat> and then that gives me c equals a half. A half. Yes. And then we've got a few more answers that have um, been put in the chat. So you can gather lots of answers from your students and using Desmos in a similar way to before. Um, let me stop sharing uh, and find my screen again. I'm going to get rid of that. I mean, students have come across this idea that you can have an equation and multiple values. If you have x plus y equals 12, for example, when they start doing work on straight line graphs, they'll know that you have lots of possible combinations. So it's, they may not have come across this in terms of doing simultaneous equations and having two equations and three unknowns, <clears throat> but they've come across it in other contexts. Okay, I think I've just typed in my equation wrong. <laughs> um, and I've lost the whiteboard. Okay, I can help. That was when B was zero. Zero, yeah. A was negative a half. Ah, negative a half, not negative 1.5. Ah, oh, that's much happier. Okay, so what you're showing here, Claire, um, let me just check. Yep. That y equals negative a half x cubed plus two and a half x um, and we agreed um, yeah the d was equal uh, goes through the three points that we wanted yeah so that line there that purple line does go through naught naught one two two one um, i'm just putting in one of the answers from the chat <laughs> sorry if this doesn't um yeah, now I've typed that incorrectly. So there's a different one, which yeah. I've just typed in from the chat, which also goes through the same points. Um, we have another one. Uh, there's no pressure here, by the way. Um, y equals x cubed minus nine, nine over two x squared 
plus 11 over 2x. That also goes through the three points. And I like that one because that's going in a different direction. That's got a positive um, x cubed. Looks like somebody else had the same idea as me and wanted b equals zero because um, zeros are much nicer. Um, I'll type in one more. Minus 8x squared plus 5x. There you go. And that, there's a third one. So we can see that all of those possible you cubics have passed through. Zoom into it a little bit so that we yes, can. Yes, of course. How's that? Is that a bit better? The, the grid's a That's bit great. operating now. I think I've recreated the one that you did on the whiteboard, I mean, uh, where B was three. three. I think A was negative three, uh, 1.5. Uh, that's why I got confused with 1.5, yeah. Uh, plus three X squared plus 0.5 X. And I hope I haven't made a mistake there. No, nope, that looks lovely. So, Again, this is again mirroring what we did with the quadratic, this idea that we can do something algebraically and then we can plot it to check that it's correct. Um, I think I possibly saw one equation on the chat which wasn't quite right. Uh, and you would have identified, you would have discovered that it wasn't right when you tried to plot it. But also seeing the variety um, now, presumably, we could use a slider, Claire, to show us the whole, the full range of possibilities. Um, but... Yes, I've, I've got in, um, in the actual curve fitter problem, um, there are a couple of options which have a slider. So um, for the problem that the students see, we've got a GeoGebra page which has a single slider. Um, which shows that there are lots and lots and lots of different cubics that all pass through those three points. Um, in the and teachers... There, and there you've restricted A to be no greater than five and no smaller... That can be, that can be changed. So if you want to A... So this is a um, Jojo profile. Um, oops, what have I just done? <laughs> I'm just going to refresh that. Right, I'll try that again. I think the same thing happened to me the other day. Okay, so I've just right clicked on settings and then I should be able to change my top A to 10 and my bottom A. It doesn't like me doing that, does it? I'll be short technical hitch. I don't know why it doesn't like me. Well, try changing okay. the minimum value first. I was going to just try changing one value. Uh, okay. So now I've changed yes. the top value to 10 and then hopefully I am not going to delete first. I'm going to make it 15. Yay, there we go. So if you want, you can change the slider. Um, you can also change the uh, increments. So at the moment, okay, so it looks like it's moving in point ones. Yep. If, if any teachers want to do this, then can we go back to your the whiteboard way where we had our simultaneous equations? Yes. Work out how we can express yep. B and C in terms of A, and then this is. So when B equals three, we could work out A and C. When B equals zero, we could work out A and C but we could have done something slightly different. Yep. Um, expressing B in terms of A, expressing C in terms of A, and then having an equation all in terms of A. So I've just uh, got rid of some of the specific yep. values that we found. Uh, that's great. Starting with this equation, uh, we can, for some reason I decided I wanted everything in terms of A probably because that was the coefficient of x cubed that felt like the most important thing. So I took this equation here uh, and I rearranged it to get minus three minus two b over six equals a. That's correct, isn't it? 
But don't you want B in terms oh, of Oh, yes, I do. I'll try that again and make I the correct I thing the subject. I think you just wanted to demonstrate it. You knew how to use the array. Yeah. So. I'll try that again. I want um, B in terms of A. So I get, I thought that didn't look quite right. Minus 3 minus 6A equals 2B. So B is equal to minus 3 over 2 minus 3A. Does that look a bit friendlier? That is what I was expecting you to. Yeah, that's what you expect me to do, yeah. Yes. Um, and then for C, I've got a choice of equations that I want to, that I can put it in. I'm going to choose this top one here because um, it's got smaller numbers. I like small numbers. Um, so 2 equals A plus B plus C. 2 equals A plus minus 3 over 2 minus 3A with some unnecessary brackets plus C. I'm not quite sure why I'm taking quite so long to write this down. So C is 2A plus 7 over 2. I think and um, I am now going to try and remember that and put it into Desmos. Share screen. Share. Not yet. So I think I just said y equals ax cubed. Okay. We'd like to add a slider. And I think your b is negative three a minus one point five. That sounds about right. And then your C, I think, was 2A plus 3.5. So you're writing the cubic, and instead of AX cubed plus BX squared plus CX, you're replacing B by an expression in terms of A and C by an expression in terms of A. Yep. And then hopefully, as we change our A, it always passes through those three points. And um, with a similar way from um, in GeoGebra, you can change the, your settings on A. So if I wanted it to go from minus 50 to 50, I can right click and then we've got, yeah, we get huge graphs. So that's not, not particularly helpful. Um, there is a teacher version of the, um, GeoGebra file with the slider um, on teacher resources. So somewhere down here. And with this one, you can actually see the function on the side as well and how it changes as A changes. Okay. Um, so this, this seems a really nice way of showing um, just how uh, initially we got a few equations and we plotted them um, and saw that they all went through 001221 and now we've got the generality um, and that feels like a really lovely way of going from the particular to the general. Um, and like I said earlier, it mimics what we were doing with the quadratics. So and we, we've still got the quadratic solution. So if I put my slider on A equals zero, our quad quadratic solution has uh, popped up again. Yes. So we then thought that students might be ready to tackle something slightly more challenging. Do you want to talk about part 2a? Yeah, so part 2a, we were starting to work a bit towards what the original problem was with the turning points. Um, and this time we decided to make one of the two points a turning point. Um, the reason that we picked one, two first is that it actually makes for a slightly nicer equation. Um, 
So I think I'll go back to sharing the whiteboard. And the other thing I also do is just bring that screen back up. Oh, uh, somebody's asked in the chat, um, how do you get a slider? Um, on Desmos, it is quite nice because if you start typing in AX cubed, it will ask you, do you want a slider? Um, on GeoGebra, you have to actually physically put in a slider. Do you want to just demonstrate it, Claire? Yeah, I'll just demonstrate it. So I'll stop showing this. And I'll go back to, yes, my apologies. I had the chat outside the, um, where I was looking. Okay, we're we back on to Desmos. Is that back onto Desmos, Charlie? Yes, sorry, yeah. yes. Yeah. So if I just start typing in y equals ax or cubed, and it says at the bottom, add slider a. So then if I click on that, I'll get my slider. Um, if I wanted something with... Uh, so I, wanted just check. Yep. I mean, I'm just thinking, even if you're not working, you know, with cubics, let's imagine you're just doing straight line graphs here. Y yep. equals 4X plus A. And, and I'm then you have the slider and up and down it goes. If you had Y equals BX or a, a, AX plus two, Yep. You have the slider. What do you do? You just click on. You just click on add slider. Um, or if you wanted AX plus B, um, you can choose to add one slider or the other slider or both. So AX plus B just gives you. So that two gives sliders. You, it shows you how the gradient, one shows you how the gradient is changing, the other one shows you how the intercept is changing. Yeah. Uh, and what happens, yes, when the gradient is yeah. negative. Great. And it's not it's not particularly useful, but you can also um, animate these. So for this case, I can get it to just ping A back and forth. And how did you do that? I clicked on the little play button on the okay. side. So just, just down here. And the same is with B. Worth, is it worth showing us on GeoGebra how to do this as well? Um, if I know how to do this, yes, on GeoGebra, um, there's also a little play button by the slider. Okay. So if I click that, it will... Oh, somebody thinks GeoGebra 6 will now give you sliders automatically. I, I might be using an old form of GeoGebra. Right. Okay, so we'll go back to the curve fitter problem. I mean, it's fantastic when I compare, the, when I think about the amount of time my students used to spend plotting graphs yes. all by hand and how long it used to take them and being able to see visually what's happening in these situations and for the algebraic expressions uh, to be mirrored by the diagrammatic, the geometrical, it seems so powerful. Okay, so part, 2A next? Yeah, part 2A. Um, somebody in chat has just said you don't have to use A and B as your sliders. That, that's quite correct. Um, but because we were started with cubics, which we normally use um, AX cubed plus BX squared plus CX plus D, I was sticking with A and B. But somebody said you can use Y equals MX plus C if you want. Okay, um, part 2A, this is where we're starting to think about um, a cubic which has one turning point. Um, so I think I was aiming to go back to the whiteboard. Okay, so hopefully that is now there again. And I'm going to get rid of all this working again. It seems to be a very small rubber. There we go. Okay, so with the um, case when we have one of the turning points, 
Um, essentially, the only key stage five knowledge that's needed is the derivative. So dy by dx is 3ax squared plus 2bx plus c. And if I want 1, 2 to be a turning point, this tells me that naught equals 3a plus 2b plus c. Because when x equals 1, one. the gradient is going to be 0. Yeah. Yeah, a common mistake on this sort of things is for people to still put in two on the um, left hand side. So, so, I now, now, have, so yeah. now we're going to have three equations because you've got the two equations on the left and you've now got this equation. Um, I'm just writing out the wrong one again. Just... Yeah, you've got two equals a plus b plus c. Yeah, I'm about to write the same one out twice. And then you've got one equals 8a plus 4b plus 2c. I think now that I've got three equations, I'm going to start numbering them. And so now we've got three, three equations and three unknowns. Well, I suppose... Um, Initially, we had four equations and four unknowns, but we used the equation with naught naught to give us d equals zero and just got rid of that. So we reduced the problem to three equations and three unknowns. Um, if we take two minus one, we get two equals minus two a minus b. I think that's correct. And then if we take um, three minus 2, 2, we get the same thing that we got before, hopefully. Does that look okay, Charlie? I'm checking. Performance maths, it's always great fun. Yes. Okay, so now I'm going to renumber these 4 and 5. And I'm going to do five plus two lots of four. Uh, so five plus two lots of four. I think that's one. Yes. I think that's two A. And hopefully that disappears. Yes. Yep. So I'm now going to get A equals a half. Uh, finding the easiest equation I can possibly stick it back into um, I, I've now got a choice between dealing with a negative or dealing with a six. I think I'm going to deal with a six. I'm slightly happier with sixes. <laughs> Plus two B. So I think that gives me B equals minus three. And then sticking it back into two equals A plus B plus C. Two equals a half minus three plus c i think that gives me c equals minus a half so i think that i get a equals a half i'm not sure about the minus a half claire a plus b plus c no it's not is it so it would be four and a half yes that's yeah. what i made it yes i think i'll just change that to a four. Um, Claire, so yep. what's nice about what's happened right now is you've got just unique values for A, B and C. Yeah. So the, the one extra piece of information. So in terms of conversation with students, I would hope that this suggests to them that there is a unique cubic that satisfies all those conditions. And if we would go back to the graphs that you were showing us earlier, just that went through the origin one, 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 two, and mm -hmm. two, one, we might find the one that we're looking for that did have a gradient of zero, one, two. Which I think is this one. 
Sorry. You're not sharing your screen. I'm not sharing my screen. Nope. Sorry. Share. So I've just been moving the slider until I get A equals 0 0.5. And now the question is, if we plotted the graph with the A, B and C that, you ju that we've just yeah. found using the simultaneous equations, does it give us the same cubic? Yeah. And hopefully we'll see that it does. Um, I'm afraid I didn't make a note of what your values were. Uh, I actually did this time. <laughs> uh, somebody in the chat has said that you can use fractions rather than writing 0.5. Yeah. Um, yes. yeah, that that's absolutely true. I, I tend to, if I can, I tend to go for 0 0.5 because that means I don't end up on the bottom of a fraction and then start typing my X at the bottom. Um, so 0.5 X cubed minus 3X squared plus 4.5X is still passing through these three points. Um, it looks like we've got a minimum in the right place. Um, what we can do, I think, with one of these, I thought we could show the extremums, but I'm not sure. I can't see a way of doing that. But the important thing, this looks the same as the one that you were showing us on the previous window, which had, yeah. there we are. Yeah. Uh, I mean, obviously the axes are, are different, but that is the one that we were after. And we've been able to recreate, we knew it existed. We didn't know, um, well, I suppose once we knew that A equals a half gave us this, I suppose we wouldn't necessarily be sure that it wasn't A equals 0.49. Well, yeah. one of the things we can do is we can add extremums. So if I select this function and add extremums, it now shows me where the maximum are. It's labeled them D and E. Right. Very nice. Which we can change. Okay. So we can see that when A equals 0 0.5, yes. which I can't get because I'm not very good with the mouse, that D is lying on top. And we can also change the settings and say, we want so, it to show, no, uh, on the wrong. But can I find point. what A is when the turning point is a two one? Yep, I'm just trying to change these settings. <laughs> Name and value. Oh, that's horrible. Okay, so I, I've just changed it so we can now see the value. So we can now see that at one, at 0.5, D is at one, two. Yes. Uh, we can hide these again, which is quite nice. Um, so you said uh, find the one where the turning point is at two, one. So I think I need to go this way a bit. Okay. And I Ooh. think that's part 2B of our question. That is part 2B. What's quite nice about this one is that the extreme isn't at a nice value. I'm not on the right It, it sounds clear that you've been, you're enjoying giving the students something which gives them an awkward solution. Which gives and, them something a little bit nicer, and, uh, well, nicer a little bit more interesting. I know Claire, I don't want anyone to go off and think that um, she's cruel and nasty. That is not the intention. So what we can see here is that it looks like it's somewhere between A equals 1.3 and A equals 1.4. So I think we can make a, probably an educated guess that it might be one and a third. And so the need to do some algebra um, it becomes obvious. Yeah. Um, we don't have very much time. I yes. quite to show that we did eventually uh, build up to the original question that Claire had found sort of that was published, I don't know, about 10 years ago on Enrich. Um, we can tell it's about 10 years old because the idea of this problem, I think it's 6,427. Yes. Um, 
and right now the current problems are in the 14,000s. So you can tell something about... We're, the, we're about to hit, yeah, we're about to hit 15,000, I think, yeah. fairly soon. So you can tell something yeah. about the history, how old a problem is. Um, so shall we show them part three? Uh, yes. We, we hadn't intended to work on this this afternoon, but we thought you might enjoy working on this sort of as a homework and and um, and perhaps have a go at part two B in your own time as well. Um, yeah. So part part three is is the bit that was sort of halfway through the old problem, um, which was can you find a cubic through not not um, where the points one two and two one are both turning points. Now, if students have a bit of a play with uh, one of these GeoGebra files, they should hopefully start to think that this isn't possible. I can either get the turning point to be on 2, 1, or I can get it on to 1, 2. But no matter how much I play with this A, I, I can't get both at the same time. Um, so this is probably not surprising because yes. you've got four unknowns and five constraints. And I know that you were very keen to keep adding levels of constraint and just see how that affected the number of possible yeah. solutions. You want to say something about that, Claire? Yeah, so in, in part one, um, we have three pieces of information or three constraints. We have the three points it passes through. Um, a cubic equation has got four, we can call degrees of freedom. So four different uh, parameters. Um, so with part one, there isn't enough information to determine the parameters um, absolutely. And then we end up with lots of different values. In part 2a and 2b, we get one extra piece of information, which is one of the two turning points. That gives us a fourth equation. So we now have um, a system of four equations with four unknowns, um, which potentially have a unique solution, not definitely. And then for part three, we've got now five pieces of information um, for our four unknowns. And in this case, it turns out you can't solve all those equations at the same time. Um, writing out a formal proof is one of the things that students find quite difficult. So playing with the slider, they can convince themselves that there isn't a solution. Um, but actually writing out a proof is a bit trickier. So what we have is we have two different proof sorters um, to help students with that as a bit of a scaffold. Um, so I'll click on proof sorter one, just to show you what it looks like. So we have a set of statements. Uh, students can move them around. Um, we've tried to be nice by having the first statement saying start and the last statement ends with a therefore and therefore you cannot do it. And students can move these around uh, when they think they've got it in the right order for this proof sorter. Uh, they can click the submit button and it will tell them whether or not they're correct. Um, this first proof starts with the turning points and starts with uh, what that means about the gradient. Uh, the second proof sorter is a bit longer um, and it follows sort of the thought processes that we've been going through and starts by finding lots of equations and trying to serve, solve them. Um, with this one, uh, we were playing with it this morning and we realised that actually there were lots of different ways you could have your statements and still have a complete proof. So if you move your uh, statements around, you don't get a submit button appear. But what you can do is you can show a possible solution at the end. Um, what I quite like about this one is because I've got so many equations, I had to find lots of ways of referring to them. Um, and that's why we end up with star, 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 three stars, daggers, and then I think there's a double dagger somewhere. <laughs> there is. Uh, there is, which also gives students a bit of idea about what order we were intending them to do this in. Yes. Um, I was going to label them using brackets one, brackets two, but that didn't look quite right. Um, so students can have, look, have a look for that. They can also try and work out their own proof using these two as templates. 
Um, and and they can also yeah. take the ideas of the two proof sorters, where, for example, we've shown that one, two can't be a turning point if yeah. all the other four conditions are satisfied. So you've got five conditions, and in the two proof sorters, one of a different uh, one condition is not satisfied if the other four are so with your students you could say to them okay now create a proof where these four conditions are satisfied but not this one so it's quite nice we, we want students to engage with proof we know how difficult it is if they haven't had much experience and especially with problems like of this sort but we thought that giving them two proof sorters might also encourage them to create their own Yes, yeah, so I think this first one um, fixes the turning points um, or fixes the turning points at x equals one and x equals two. It also uses the fact it passes through naught to naught. Um, and then I think we've said it must pass through one, two and then prove that it can't pass through two, one. Um, the other proof sorter I think shows that um, it doesn't go through the origin, I think. No, I think this one goes to the origin. I can't remember. It might not. <laughs> we wrote out lots of different proofs. No, this one still goes through the origin. Ah. Um, but one of the two points isn't a turning point. Okay. So students could decide to try and find a proof where they start with one, two, and two, one are the turning points and then show that it doesn't pass through the origin. Yes. Um, and I think we have probably talked about some of this in the teacher resources. Yes, Claire has mentioned teacher's yeah. resources. Quite a lot. <laughs> All our problems have got teacher's resources with these five headings. Um, why do the problem, possible approach, key questions, possible support that you might want to offer your students and possible extensions. Uh, so teachers find this quite useful. Um, this is a live problem because it's a current problem on our, in our feature. So students can submit a solution. So on the left hand menu, um, you can, you'll be able to see, I think Claire's about to point out where it is. Um, there, submit a solution. Yeah, so just, just see. And these problems are going to be live till something like the 1st of February, I think. And then they'll stay on the site, but um, there won't be the option to send in solutions. Uh, and a week later or so, we'll then publish some of the solutions that we've received from, our student, from your students. So do encourage your students to take a look at this problem and send us in their solutions. Uh, we'll be looking at them at the beginning of February. Yeah. So I'll just remind you where you can find all of these problems again. Um, so if you go to second, so these um, buttons at the top will be there on every single page. Um, if you go to secondary teachers, latest feature, and then you can find the, the problems that we've put into this feature. So one of them is a, an 11 to 16 problem, which is all about straight lines. Uh, we've got a problem about quadratics. Um, we've got curve fitter and exploring cubic functions, which are about cubic functions. Um, curve hunter is a little bit different. It's a little bit like Pictionary, I suppose. Can you draw a curve that does this? Um, because this problem straddles key stage four, key stage five, we've also put it into the post-16 um, area. So we haven't separated out students and teachers for post-16. We've just lumped everybody together. Um, yeah, be, uh, Claire, before yeah. you leave that page, can you just go back to the page we were on just now? Yep. Yeah. And just, I'd like to mention that you'll see there's some star ratings. Oh, yes. The problem. And the star rating gives you some idea of the difficulty of the problems. So diamond collector and quadratic matching have got one star, meaning they are more accessible than the two star problems. And the two star problems are slightly more accessible than the three star problems, which is the maximum number of stars we ever give. So just to let you know, we've been focusing on a two star problem, you know, a reasonably hard problem, 14 to 18 because we knew there'd be some sixth form teachers here, as well as some key stage four teachers. So we wanted to sort of bridge that gap, but we also 
uh, ho hopefully we've managed to create something where there is a low threshold and many students can at least make a start on this problem and in a way that prepares them for uh, the, the harder questions at the end. And we hope that the, the proof sorter also is a way of helping students who may not have um, worked on proof before. And I think now Claire's going to show you what there is in the post-16 yep. feature. Um, so I haven't yet managed to make the pictures clicky, so I apologise for that. Um, to go to the latest feature, if you click on where it says latest feature. Um, so again, we've got three of those problems that you saw in the secondary feature, which also appear in Key Stage 5. Um, so Curve Hunter, Exploring Cubic Functions, Curve Fitter. For some reason, they're in a slightly different order, I don't know why. Um, and we also have a problem which is intended just for Key Stage 5. Uh, which is curvy equation. That's probably a year 13 problem. Um, I've also tried to put in a couple of articles for six form students who want to read up a bit about um, uh, curves. Uh, these both link to PLUS, which is a, a, a sister site of Enrich. Um, I think we've, we've overrun very, very slightly. Um, I think I'd probably like uh, to ask Liz to come back and say hello again and to wrap us up. Thank you very much, Claire, uh, and thank you very much, Charlie. Uh, I shall um, share my screen again uh, so that we go back to the PowerPoint just to conclude our session today. Um, uh, hopefully you can see the PowerPoint now. Charlie, Claire, could you just nod at me? Can you see the PowerPoint slide? Wonderful, yes. thank you. Um, just to remind you all, if you don't already uh, follow Enrich on Twitter, our handle is uh, at Enrich Maths. You may wish to use the um, hashtag Enrich Live to, to um, carry on the discussions from this afternoon's session. Um, Another way of keeping uh, in touch with Enrich is to sign up for our email newsletter that goes out approximately once every half term. And I would thoroughly recommend either the newsletter and or uh, following us on Twitter to keep just to keep up to date with what we're doing uh, and to find out about similar events in the future. Uh, a couple of you uh, on the chat were asking about a scheme of work that the particular task that Claire and Charlie were trying fits into. Um, I posted up this link in the chat, hopefully um, that was helpful at the time, but um, on this page you will find um, details um, linking uh, enriched tasks to the secondary curriculum, including our secondary curriculum mapping document, which uh, is a, a Google Sheet which takes all the objectives from the secondary mathematics curriculum um, and links in enriched tasks. So I hope that answers uh, the question that one of you was asking earlier. Um, I mentioned that we're recording the video now, uh, the, the event now, um, and it will be posted uh, later in the week on this page. So do keep an eye out on the page and feel free to share the recording with your colleagues um, uh, as you see fit. Um, we very much appreciate your contributions via the chat. If you would like to save a copy of the chat for your own purposes, do remember to do that. Uh, probably now is a good time. You, you can see that there are three dots um, in the chat window and that will bring up the option of, of downloading it should you wish. I mentioned our funding from Trinity College at the start of the session. We're intending to run several events like this one uh, in the future. Uh, talking through some of the problems in our current features and we would love your feedback um, on today's session, what you felt went well, how you feel we could tweak similar events in the future. Um, I hope Claire is um, very efficiently going to pop that uh, link to our feedback form on the chat. Thank you so much Claire. So yes, she has done that. Now while it's fresh in your mind. Well I, I think that... I presume Liz will send, we, we might email everybody who's signed up with a link to where we've put the recording because uh, it, it occurred to us that what we should do is we'll put also a link to the feet where the feature is so we'll have the feature and the recording so if anybody isn't quite sure where to find the problem that we've been talking about they'll find it there absolutely yes you'll get an email reminder about that 
So I think that brings us to the end of this afternoon's session. Thank you very much, all of you, for joining us. Um, we hope you found the session useful and we look forward to welcoming you again at a future event. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>